We've been going through the book of uh, 1 Corinthians uh, for several weeks now, and I've been preaching a series of textual lessons from this book of Paul's, the apostle, to the church in Corinth. And we are getting to the point in chapter 4 now uh, where he's been building on some themes that he has been uh, laying down. As a bit of review, in, in chapter 1, he reminded them in the way of introduction that they were called, uh, he was called an apostle uh, of Jesus Christ, not by his own will, but by the will of God. And uh, by extension, the Corinthian church, they were called by God as well through the gospel. And that they had been sanctified or made right in Christ. And the, we, we mentioned this several times, that the focus needed to be put back on Christ because the problem that the Corinthian church has is they become arrogant in various ways. They've exalted human wisdom. They've exalted human leadership. They've exalted their own spiritual gifts one against another. And they need to return back to a focus on Christ, remember where they came from and who it is that has put them in service and to serve him once again. They'd exalted men in human wisdom. In chapter 2, uh, he emphasizes that faith must be in God's power, not signs and wisdom. And he talked about how his own preaching was a demonstration of that. He came in fear, weakness, and trembling. And remember, why did he do that? Well, so that their faith would be not in the power and wisdom of men, but in the power and wisdom of God. That God's truth doesn't actually come through wisdom. Man cannot know it. Man has never known it in and of himself. And that is why we need spiritual revelation. And that's why they need to listen to their apostle. Because their apostle has the spirit of God and has the wisdom of God revealed through the spirit to him. And he's trying to reveal it to them. And so even today, we need to be reminded not to get uh, too big for our britches, as we sometimes say in Alabama. We don't need to get puffed up that we know all this stuff of human wisdom. We need to get back to the source of wisdom, and that is revealed through the Holy Spirit. Uh, he's talked about it. God's mystery was revealed through God's Spirit, through His Spirit. And by extension, spiritual people, now again, the Corinthians, they had the Spirit of God, they had spiritual gifts, but they were not acting like spiritual people, because they were rejecting a man who had spiritual revelation. That is the Apostle Paul. In chapter 3, we talked about the contradiction, the irony that was occurring, because they were supposedly spiritual, but they were divided. And we talked about how that, those two things cannot happen in, in, in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 3. Uh, and they, they had some false views of Paul, Apollos, and Cephas, and he corrects those. He uses that farming analogy that we're all just farmers in God's field and you are God's crop and you're the result of God's growing. You're the result of his edification. And he, then he turns us to a, a building analogies. And he says, you know, I've laid a foundation, a foundation because God has given me the grace and opportunity to do this and nobody else can lay another foundation other than the one that's already been laid. And then he gives a warning about anyone who would destroy God's building. And we talked about the word destroy there means to ruin or defile. Anyone who does that needs to be very careful because they were building, so to speak, on the foundation that had been laid with uh, imperishable things. I'm oh, sorry, perishable things. Get, you know, hay and straw and all these other materials that are not going to stand the test of time. When the bad times come, the only thing that's going to stand up is going to be the foundation of Jesus Christ. When the waves come, we talked about last week, when the bad times hit, this church, you know, applying it to us, this church will either stand or fall based on what is truly built on Jesus Christ. If we build on human wisdom, if we attract people with other things, then when adversity comes, those things will not stand in our own adversity and, and, and in the day of, of judgment. And then he reminds them that everything is Christ, all are Christ. In fact, a Paul, uh, Paul, Apollos, Cephas, these are all servants of theirs through Christ. And so why are you exalting one over another? They're all here for you to build you up. And so he says, whether things uh, here or things to come, whether life or death, all things are Christ. So that brings us to chapter 4. And we're going to look at this in three sections. Uh, the first section is going to be talking about how Christ will judge his servants. Then we're going to talk about the examples of the apostles. And then a final appeal and exhortation to the church there in Corinth. So let's start with the way that Christ will judge his servants. And this is founded in the way that Paul viewed himself. How did Paul view himself? Well, let's look at it as a way of review. In chapter 1, verse 1, I have these verses on the board up here. He viewed himself as a, Paul, a called apostle of Christ. That means one sin of Christ. 
Uh, not through his own will, not out there doing his own thing, but just serving Christ. In chapter 3, verse 5 through 9, he considered himself as just God's farmer, God's worker. He says, you know, consider us all as servants. And then he goes on and talks about how one planted, one, one planted and one watered and God was given the increase. We're just workers on God's farm. And then in verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 10, he considered himself as God's master builder. Uh, a wise architect. We talked about the word there being where we get the word architect from. The difference between an architect today and an architect back then is an architect today, he draws the plans, but he doesn't actually get his hands dirty and build anything. But back then, an architect or wise master builder, he would make the plans, and then he would go out there and actually lay the foundation and get his hands dirty. And so that's what he's just God's worker, God's builder according to God's plan. In chapter 3, there in, in verse 22, he says, you know, he considers himself as belonging to them. You know, I'm your servant on behalf of God. So that's, that's how he considers himself. Now, to get this next point that he's going to be laying down in, in chapter 4 and verse 1, we have to understand what this is. Raise your hand if you know what this is. This is a, called a trireme. You ever heard of a trireme? This is a Greek ship. It's a rowing vessel, and it has three, row, three decks. You see these guys sitting up here? Well, there's guys underneath them, and then there's guys underneath them. You see these little portholes. Oars come out of there, and to keep water from going in there, they have little leather closures, and you stick the pole through there, but still they got wet. And this is called a trireme. Actually, this is a reproduction of a trireme. It's called the Olympia, and they actually really put this out in the Mediterranean and tried to, tried to float it. And they learned a lot because... They, 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 they got, those three decks of oars kept bumping into each other, and they, they couldn't really figure out how the Greeks ever made that work. But here's actually a, another picture of this. These are You see the rowers up here, but there's actually rowers, and there's rowers down here. These are called the under rowers. And that's, where we're, that's what we need to understand when, when we get to this verse. Let me read uh, a couple verses here. Uh, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Starting in verse 1, he says, Let a man regard us in this manner, as servants of Christ, as stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. But to me, it's a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human uh, court. In fact, I do not even examine myself. For I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in, dar in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each, one's, each man's praise will come to him from God. And so what we have here, in my version, New American Standard 4 verse 1 says, consider us as servants of Christ, as stewards of the mysteries of God. This first word really means under rower. Literally, it means under rower. And it came from the idea of a guy way down here in the belly of a ship, and he's just rowing. Anybody ever seen Ben-Hur? You remember that scene where Ben-Hur is having to, he, he's an under rower on a ship, and people are dying left and right? Well, that's the, where this comes from. Later, uh, you've got to realize that these triremes were built several hundred years before the time of Paul. And by the time of Paul comes along, this is figuratively used as anybody who's just a servant. And what this means is literally that Paul is not the one calling the shots. He's not up there on deck steering the boat. That's Christ. He's just Christ's under rower. He's just doing the things that, that he wants him to do. So if, if I had hired you as a hired hand, you would just be the guy carrying out the decisions that I make. And that's why we may get the word servant of Christ here. Consider us as a servant of Christ. But, the, but, but I think the, the modern English translation does it disservice because it's not the same word that's used in other places in the New Testament that the word ser servant is used. There's a lot more imagery here than that. But the idea is he's just following orders. And then he quickly turns to another analogy in the same verse. He says, as stewards of the mysteries of God. So we need to understand what this idea of steward is. A steward is somebody who's a house manager. And not a housekeeper, but somebody who I would place over the affairs of my household. And he has placed Paul over the affairs of the household of the Corinthian church. And, through, and he says, I'm stewards of the mysteries of God. And what are these mysteries? Well, it's God's revelation. It's the gospel that's been given through the, the Spirit. So in order to see this, we need to understand what, what the responsibilities and get in our mind a picture of a steward. 
And I was thinking in Bible examples, and the best one I can think of is Joseph in, Potiphar, in Potiphar's house. Do you remember Joseph in Potiphar's house? What was he? He was a steward. And, and actually, Genesis 39, it says that, you know, Potiphar bought him, and he found that, and Potiphar saw that whatever he touched, God was blessing it. And he says he made him the, the, uh, basically overseer over his whole household. And he ran the affairs of that household. It was him that called the shots and did this and that. And so he was a faithful steward, wasn't he? He was trustworthy because when his wife, when Potiphar's wife, and that's what this depiction of, when Potiphar's wife actually wanted to uh, advance on him, he said, no, how could I sin against God? You know, how could he uh, do that? So in verse 2 here, Paul reminds the Corinthians, he says, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. In other words, faithfulness is a job qualification of stewards. And what he's saying, you know, for instance, if you hired a person, you know, I don't know if anybody's ever had somebody come in and clean their house or, or, or whatever, but you, you'd want somebody that would be trustworthy if you were going to be putting them over the affairs. So imagine you wanted somebody to manage the affairs of your bank account and do your grocery shopping. They would need to be trustworthy. And what he's saying here is that God has put him in charge of these things because God has viewed him as trustworthy. And, then, and it says as much in 1 Timothy 1.12 that he says, I thank the Lord that God has counted me you know, faithful and has put me into his service. Well, that's what he's describing there. God, or Christ counted him faithful as a faithful servant. And so we've often looked at this in verse 2 as, as just a general thing, and we apply it directly to ourselves, and we miss the argument that Paul was making to the Corinthian church. Yes, of course, we as stewards of Christ, we're supposed to be found uh, trustworthy, but by implication, he's telling the Corinthian church that he is a trustworthy servant because he was chosen by God, and so if Christ sees me as, as faithful, then you should as well. So who in the end would evaluate Paul's performance? Well, it would be Jesus. It would be Christ. Just like if you have a, uh, a household uh, attendant or somebody over your affairs, you are going to be the one to ultimately manage that uh, judgment. And Paul mentions three forms of judgment here in verse 3 and th three through 5. He talks about man's judgment. Uh, it's a little thing for me to be judged by you. He talks about self-judgment. I don't know anything about myself, but that doesn't make me righteous before God. And then finally, he talks about the Lord's judgment, the one who hired him as a household manager, and that's the one that matters. So how might some judge Paul? That's the question. Well, and one, can, you can just imagine from what we've read up into the text how they might be judging Paul. In chapter 1, verse 17, he said, well, I didn't preach with wisdom of word. So they may say, well, Paul's not that good of a speaker. He's not that clever. Uh, he doesn't even present himself that well. In chapter 2 and verse 3, he came in weakness, fear, and trembling. What kind of preacher is this? You know, what kind of apostle is this? Uh, he only just talks about simple lessons. All his lessons are real simple. You know, he doesn't really talk about the, the meat. Uh, verse 3, too, you can imagine them saying, well, he just preaches milk. You know, he never gets to the, to the real good stuff. But all the while, he's claiming to be a wise master builder. The, the implication here is that the Corinthians were not pleased with Paul. And they didn't like, you know, their perception of what an apostle should be and what, the, what Paul actually was are two different things. And he's going to bring out to light in this chapter that they got their thinking all backwards. What they think an apostle should be is not what the apostles actually are. And by extension, they need to become more like the apostles and less like their puffed up arrogant selves. So, we see there in, in chapter uh, 4 and verse 3 that man's judgment has little value. Any human court, uh, literally it says um, he doesn't really care to be examined by them or the judgment of any human day. You say, yours may say human court there, but really it's, he says, by any human day. We get the phrase, everybody's going to get their day in court. Well, remember before, he's, he's talked about several times in this letter about the God's day of judgment, the day of adversity. He says, I don't really, I'm not concerned about the human day. I'm concerned about the day of the Lord, is what, is what he's really getting at here. And, and he says, you know, I don't judge myself uh, because, you know, I could be thinking I'm doing a great job as God's household manager, but the boss shows up and says, no, you're really not. So it really doesn't matter what I think of myself either. 
He said, I, had a, you know, I was conscious of nothing. I have a good conscience. But in the end, God's going to make that judgment. Because, in verse 5, he says, the Lord reveals the heart. He shines light. And he uses this light analogy here in verse 5. Uh, wait till the Lord comes. He's going to bring light to the hidden things. He's going to disclose the motives of the heart. He's going to reveal the thing. He's the only one that can peer into a man's heart. And so he's going to either praise the good household managers or the good servants, and he's going to condemn the bad ones. And so we have that judgment. And in verse 5, we have, therefore, that's the conclusion of his argument, is that the Lord's going to judge his own servants. As an, as an apostle, the Lord's going to judge him. And by implication, the Lord's going to judge them as well as their servants, and, and, and because they're workers in the vineyard too. Because only God can re either reveal, reveal the motives of the hearts, and he'll either condemn or praise them. You ever uh, been in a babysitter situation where, uh, I don't know if you ladies may have been babysitting some kids, and, these, and, and the, the child is, is upset with what the babysitter is doing, and, and, and you know, does it really matter? I mean, who hired that babysitter? The babysitter, I'm trying to extend on this household steward analogy. The babysitter is a servant or a steward of the parents. And the parents are the ones who will judge the performance of the babysitter. The kid doesn't get to judge the performance of the babysitter. The parents give the orders to the babysitter, and the babysitter tells the kid what to do. And the child doesn't, it doesn't matter if they like it or not. Does that make sense? So the, 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 the child can throw a fit and say, oh, you're a terrible babysitter. Well, it doesn't matter what you think. It matters what your mommy and daddy thinks of me, you see? And so that's really, the, the Corinthians, in essence, they're throwing a fit because Paul has been placed as an apostle to that Corinthian church. And in the end, it doesn't matter how they, have, how they view Paul. It matters how the Lord views Paul because he's been given a job to do, and he's going to make sure that job gets done. So, who will evaluate our performance? Same way. It's going to be the Lord Jesus Christ. He's, we, we've been given stewardship in our lives to each some extent, and God is going to judge our performance. As an evangelist, the Lord ju will judge me. You know, um, And whatever you end up doing, the Lord will judge you as well. Uh, and and uh, it reminds me of, of Romans where it says, Who are you to judge another man's servant? We're not qualified to do so. You know that? Only the Lord can judge. Now, we're talking about um, not the kind of thing where people say, don't judge me. That, we're talking about a condemning judgment here, okay? At the end of the day, you know, he, the Lord is going to do the hiring and the firing, and he's going to be the one doing the praising or the condemnation. All right, so let's move into the example of the apostles. He cleverly is going to contrast himself versus them. And he's going to switch... He, he, there's a tension between what they think and what he thinks and who he is and who they are. They should become more like him, not the other way around. So how do they understand their roles as servants? Do you think they understand their roles as servants well in the Corinthian church? No, it's evidenced by all the problems. I mean, everybody who's read this letter knows that this church is full of problems. So he says in, in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 6, let me, let me pick up and start reading there. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that no one of you will become arrogant in behalf of, of one against the other. For who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? As if, and if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not? You're already filled. You've already become rich. You become kings without us. And indeed, I wish you had become kings, so that we might also reign with you. For I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all, as men condemned to death, because we've become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We're fools for Christ's sake, but you're prudent in Christ. We're weak, but you're strong. You're distinguished, but we're without honor. To this present hour, we're both hungry and thirsty, and are poor, poorly clothed, and are roughly treated, and are homeless, and we toil, working with our hands. When we're reviled, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure. When we're slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become as the scum of the earth, the dregs of all things, even until now. And so he starts off this section saying these things have been figuratively applied. Well, what things has he been talking about? He's been talking about the worker analogy. He's been talking about the builder analogy. He's been talking about the household steward-servant analogy. 
He's saying, you know, these things I've applied to Apollos and, and Paul here so that, that's the reason, you don't go above what's been written. You know, you don't, what they've been doing, they've been puffed up and going beyond the scriptures and beyond the authority and leaning on human wisdom, exalting human leadership. And furthermore, so you would not be puffed up. And puffed up really means, literally, in Greek, it means inflated like a bag, like a billows that they would that they would flame a fire with, it's full, of high, it's full of air. That's what arrogance is, you know, you're just puffed up, uh, but it's, it's, it's nothing, you know, it, unnecessarily. So, he says in verse, in verse 7 here, he says, who judges you, literally it means, who judges you differently? Who judges, you know, some, some translations say, who judges you superior, but it's really, who, who's, you know, this is the way that, that servants are judged. I've just told you how servants are judged. And who's given you a different standard? And, and the, 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 the idea is no, no one. No one's given them a different standard. And his next question is, what do you actually have that you didn't receive? You mean from the apostles, you know, because he's the one who laid the foundation. And the answer is nada, you know, <laughs> nothing. So what, what, what do you have left to boast in? You know, what do you have that's original that, that you can boast in? And the answer is zilch. They got nothing, you know, so... No one, not a zilch. And, and what he's doing is he's just deflating them. They've been puffed up. And what he's doing is he's just, he's just popping that balloon. He's, he, he's bringing them down to size because they've got all puffed up and arrogant. He's saying, we're the apostles. We're the stewards. We're the ones that laid the foundation. And so he's not doing this to brag on himself. He's doing this to give them back in the right frame of mind because they've been arrogant against the apostle. Do brethren get like this today? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, brethren can get puffed up against, against each other and against the teachings of the Bible today. And so I think it comes bound to this question, do we understand <coughs> our roles as servants? And that's what he's going to be going into here and talk about what a real servant is in that section that I read. Uh, what they did is they felt like they had already arrived. You know, we become Christians, we got the gifts of the Spirit, you know, we have arrived and we don't need anything. So they start getting a little arrogant. And, and, and sometimes we as Christians, we can feel like this. We would never say this, of course. No, we would never say this. But we can start acting like we have everything we need already. You know? I, don't, I don't really feel hungry like I need the Lord as much because you know, I'm already a Christian. I've already done everything I need. I, nobody's going to tell me what to do. I have the truth, and you know, I, I am a fine, upstanding member of the church. But that's not how Paul was, was feeling. And, and look, let's look at what Paul's example is. Uh, first of all, he, he chastises them. And I think this is some uh, sarcasm here. And if you have a problem with me saying that sarcasm, then let's just say it's like sarcasm and irony or ironic. It's, it's not true. Uh, in verse 8, he says, you've been satisfied already. You've already been satisfied. That means full. You've been filled to the brim already. You got what you wanted. You know, they've thought that they've already arrived. He says, you become rich. But this is not the kind of rich he's talking about in, verse, in chapter 1 where he says, you've already been rich with all grace and all knowledge. This is the kind of rich that they've already, they got what they want. They got this, the, you know, the esteem that they want. They're sitting fat and happy. And he's saying, you reigned without us. You reigned as kings without us. Some translations say you became kings, but the real, the idea is, they're acting as if they're reigning already. And what we're looking for is we're looking for a future time where we'll reign with Christ in heaven. That's what Paul's looking for. But they're, they're acting as if they're already sitting on the throne, you know, and they're fat and happy. And so they need an attitude adjustment. He says here, he says, I wish you really did reign. I wish you did. And that's why he's indicating the, the irony there. So that we might reign together with you. <laughs> he's, in other words, he's thinking... Man, I wish I was as established as you guys are because I'm still out here, you know, working, you know, <laughs> working hard trying to uh, do my stewardship. And you guys are already sitting down like it's the end, of the end of the day and the Lord's already rewarded you for the labors. And he says, basically, he's indicating that the condition of the apostles are contrasted with the wealthy and prideful Corinthian church. So, what was the condition of the apostles? Well, he says in verse 9, very interesting, he says, I think God has displayed us last as condemned to death. He uses the word a spectacle of the world to angels and to men. And I think there's some figurative analogy here. The word that, that's translated spectacle is where we get the word theater from. 
it, it, like a show. And if you've ever seen a Roman movie before, they used to make a show or display out of people dying. Do you remember that? Uh, when the Roman armies would come back, you know, the, the prisoners would be last. And those are the people that were going to be condemned to death. Or, you know, when they would have like a, a gladiator fight or any kind of games, they would usually throw the, the people that the, the death match would be the, the last thing. And so I think there may be some significance to the way he's saying the Lord, dis, you know, he displayed us last as a point of the death this theater amusement uh, to the world. Uh, but this is not just among men. He says to angels and to men. Uh, we, we've been made a spectacle of here. And, and there's a contrast between the apostles and the Corinthians here in verse 10. He says, we're fools for Christ, but you're, you're like shrewd in Christ. You know, we're, we're weak and you're strong. We're dishonored, but you're honored. And, and they're the appointed... They're the appointed stewards of God. And so what's wrong with that picture is, 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 is what we need to ask ourselves. He goes on, he's, in verse 11 he says, until the present hour, we, we, which provides a rare insight into the apostles' ministry. He includes here, he says, we. It's plural. He's, he's including all the apostles. And I think this is uh, one of the only places in the Bible where we get some insight into how the apostles were treated. We know that many of the apostles died um, based on martyrdom from extra-biblical documents, most of them say. But we really don't have a lot of evidence about how the apostles were treated in the New Testament. But here, Paul is indicating that during the time of this writing, that this is how the ministry of the apostles are going. They're both hungry and thirsty, uh, both poorly clothed and beaten. Uh, you see how hungry and thirsty go together. Poorly clothed and beaten go together, too. It's the idea of almost like ripping somebody's shirt off their back and, 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 and lashing them with it. And he says we're homeless, but the idea here is more than that, it's they're wandering about homeless. So if you think of what Paul's ministry was, did he, did he have a, set himself up a nice little villa, you know, in the Mediterranean? No. He was wandering about from town to town, poorly clothed, driven about, hungry and thirsty, um, weary from laboring with his own hands, verse 12, uh, your, your version may say toiling with their hands, but it really doesn't necessarily describe what the Greek does, which means we're worn out from working, you know, with our own hands. We're verbally abused. We're driven away. Your translation may say persecuted. That's why we can't set up in anywhere, because we're just driven about. No wonder we have to wander around. We're, we're slandered, verse 13, meaning speak ill against. We're treated like the scum of the world. And there's another word picture here for you. This it's like, you know, like when you're, um, if you've ever been working out in the yard all day, got really dirty, uh, maybe your kids do this, and you put them in the bathtub, and uh, af after, after the water drains out, all that dirt, that s scum, well, that's what this is. This is the result of like a, a, thorough, scurry, a, scur a thorough scouring. We're the dregs of, of the world. That's what, that's what the value that the world's put on us. We've become a spectacle. We're treated like the scum of the world. So what's wrong with this picture in contrast with the Corinthian church? Corinthian church, oh yeah, spiritual gifts, you know, we're puffed up and all this stuff. And here are the people who, who are the real deal. You know, they're out there, they're going through this stuff. And so that's, there, there's a contrast between who the Corinthians, what their view of stewardship is and, and, and servanthood, and what the apostles view as being a servant of Christ. So, are the Corinthians sharing in this suffering for Christ? No. It doesn't seem that they are. They have the wrong attitude. And so how did the apostles respond to all this? He says, when we're verbally ab abused, they bless. When they're driven away, they endure. And when they're slandered, they entreat. The same word here is used when he says, I beseech you, therefore, to speak the same thing. It's the same play on words we talked about in chapter 1 where he says, I call upon. You know, we're, when slandered, I don't just say, huh, can't believe they did that. And I'm not, they're going to apologize to me. No, they go and they beseech and they entreat. Uh, and they, they call upon people and reason, try to reason with them. So the, the question is, are we willing to follow the same example? Do we have the proper view of servanthood that Paul did and that the apostles did? Are we willing to suffer for the sake of Christ? Do we allow our, our servant role that God's given us to define who we are and what we do with our lives? How we respond to people, how we spend our time, 
Is our life defined by a proper role of our servanthood? If not, let's study the, the example of the apostles here that are described about true servanthood versus what we often uh, take as a, we, we call it servanthood, but are we really providing any service? And so what he does here in the, in the last section here, uh, verses 14 through 21, is he appeals to them, and he also gives them an exhortation. He's going to appeal to them as a father, but he's also going to exhort them as a father as well. Let me read this, starting in verse 14. He says, <clears throat> I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For if you have countless tutors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I became your father through the gospel. Therefore I exhort you, be imitators of me. For this reason I sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. And he will remind you of my ways which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. Now some have become arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I shall find out, not the words of those who are arrogant, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. What do you desire? Shall I come to you with a rod, or with love and a spirit of gentleness? And so he says here in the beginning of verse 14, he said, I did not write these things to browbeat you, to shame you. Literally, it means to turn you away, like, like when you're admonishing a child. You're, you do that in order to effect a change in them, not to just bring shame on them, not just to turn them away rejected. So Paul's not trying to turn them away rejected. He's trying to bring about some positive change in them, like a father would his child. His goal was to counsel them. And we talked about this in, in uh, Bible class this morning. Some translations may say admonish. But it's to counsel them or to warn them spiritually. There's even, uh, have you, has anybody heard the word uh, neuthetics? Neuthetic counseling or something like this? Biblical counseling? Uh, th this idea is from the Greek word that's used here. And this idea of just, just to take the scriptures, take God's word, and, and, and apply it to their situation and warn them gently to turn back. And he says, I did this as beloved children. I want to counsel you as my beloved children. So whereas before he may have been a little bit harsher, now he's appealing to them as a father would a son. And so he, he points out to them, while they may have many tutors, uh, you know, just like in the, in the same, the, the, the word tutor is not like, uh, it's somebody who would have stewardship in a, in a Greek household you know, as a father, I may put a, a slave or a, a steward over my child and up until the time that they would get to the right age, you know, and they would have certain responsibilities. Uh, the same words used of the Old Testament, how it's a, it was a steward or a tutor that brought us to Christ. Uh, a tutor was supposed to bring somebody up until they could be to maturity. And he says, you may have many tutors, but you only have one father. And, and so he's, he's appealing to them as this father idea that he became their father, how did he do that? Through the gospel. He says I, this was in Christ Jesus. It happened in Christ Jesus. And everything happens in Christ Jesus, which he reminded us back in chapter 1. So what he does, he says, Therefore I beseech you, or I call upon you again. You know, I'm, I'm calling you to become like me. Um, so you see how rather than just browbeating him, he's really appealing them to you know, follow me. This is the direction that I'm coming. I've laid down my example of how the apostles, this is your false view of servanthood. This is what real servanthood looks like. And so really, I want you to imitate me. Because doesn't that, isn't that what a father and a son relationship or a father-daughter relationship should do? They should imitate their parents. So children are supposed to learn to become like their fathers. And that was more important in the Greek culture where oftentimes if I was a carpenter, my son would be a carpenter. You know, if my dad was a stone layer, um, you know, my son, you know, I'd be a stone layer, my son would be a stone layer. So he wants them to imitate uh, him. And he, Paul's children in the faith should be like him. Um, if we're teaching the right things, then the people we convert should be like us. Uh, and, and if you don't, if, you, if, if that doesn't look good, then we got we to gotta get better, <laughs> you know? Because they're going to not technically rise any higher than, than we have as their example. And so that's what he's doing. And in order to facilitate that, he says in verse 17, I sent, I sent uh, Timothy to you. And what Timothy's going to do is he's going to remind them of all of Paul's ways. Not his, not his idiosyncric, you know, idiosyncrasies, like just his opinions and habits, but he says, my ways in Christ Jesus. 
And so that's how it's going to happen, because Paul is also his beloved child. And he addresses Paul there in that same verse as his beloved child. We learn in 1 Timothy 1, 2 that, that uh, when he's writing to Timothy, he says, you're my beloved child in the faith. So Timothy, according to Paul, is a faithful steward in the Lord. He's a trustworthy servant, and he's going to teach you how to become that. Now perhaps, uh, because Paul didn't come himself, because Paul had sent Timothy to them, maybe they thought, well, Paul's not going to show his face around here because he, he doesn't want to get him mixed up with us. And I think that's what he is saying later on when he says, uh, some of you become puffed up as if I'm not coming. Uh, no, he's going to come, but he just had sent Timothy in order to help them because, Paul's, because Timothy's going to remind them of the ways in Christ. And he says, the same way I teach in every church. And this is an important point. Uh, Paul's teaching is not unique just to Corinth. Now, some people have made that fact. You know, if you don't like something Paul says, well, this is a specific thing that only had to do with Corinth. Well, he says that he says the same thing in every church, and I've lifted some verses here, chapter 7, 17, 11, 16, 14, 33, 16, chapter 1, uh, and also here. His, con his teaching was consistent across the board, and so if anyone tries to isolate a teaching just to that church, uh, we need to be mindful in context of what he's saying throughout the scriptures that he teaches the same thing regardless of where he goes. Um, so anyway, in, in chapter 4 and verse 18, he says, Some of you have been uh, puffed up as if I'm not coming. And I think perhaps that's because he sent Timothy, he sent these letters instead of coming himself, but he says, I'm going to come quickly unto you if the Lord should will. I think this is an important point we need to, to, to uh, emphasize here is that he is still under the direction of the, what the Lord desires. That he's not ever taking anything into his own hands. He wants to do it if the Lord wills. Paul submits as a servant to God. And um, we're almost finished here. A couple more verses. What he's saying is that, you know, when I come there, and this is literally the translation I made, he says, I will not know the words of those puffed up, but the power. We're going to see how much power those people have. He's really laying it down. You know, he's saying... You know, these people have been talking big talk. When I get there, we're going to see how much power they have because, because these people are just all puffed up in talk. He says that by, he says God's kingdom is not based on talk or, or words. It's demonstrated by power. And I love that, you know, because this is, one, I think, one of Paul's finest moments here. He's exercising his apostleship. But he never does that to, to get his own way. Do you see that? He's always doing that to further the Lord's cause. Anytime he can appeal to them as gentle as a father, he'll do that. And so he gives them an option here at the end, doesn't he? He says, I can come with a rod or I can come with love and gentleness. And I think that's a, that's a great lesson. You know, as, as parents, we may uh, can relate to this. You know, we can do this the hard way or we can do this the easy way. And I'd rather do this the easy way. But if I have to come with a rod, we'll do this the hard way. And so, uh, again, I, I hope this, this outline has been helpful. You know, Christ is going to be the one to judge his servants. servants. He's got a stewardship to do. And by extension, we have stewardships too. Don't let other people judge your stewardship because you've got to be pleasing to God. Sometimes if we, if we surround ourselves with, if, if I'm given an important stewardship and I start slacking on it and everybody around me says, ah, oh, that's okay, don't worry about it, you know. Well, No. It doesn't matter what everybody else thinks about me. I got to report to the to the boss. You know, uh, have you ever been in a, an employment situation where the boss tells you something to do and says, "Ah, you know, that really doesn't matter. I've been working here five years." You know, you know. no. At the end of the day, I got to I got to please the boss. And the same thing with us. Conversely, you, your boss may tell you to do something, and they say, hey, "I don't like that." You know, you should just stop doing that. Well, it doesn't matter what everybody else thinks. So we need to apply this to spiritual situations as well. Um, if God tells you to do something and your family doesn't like it, it doesn't matter. You've got to report to God. If your kids don't like it, it doesn't matter. You report to God. If your brethren don't like it, it doesn't matter. Ultimately, you've got you to report to God. And so that's what Paul's teaching us. The example of the apostles here is to correct our view of stewardship. We sometimes lose the idea of how much the apostles went through to give us that example of what it really means to be a, a suffering servant. Christ is the ultimate suffering servant, but these apostles give us a good example of that as well. And then finally, this appeal and exhortation. We need to imitate those who are imitating Christ. So what will we choose? 
Are we going to choose the easy way or are we going to choose the hard way? Because God says, I, I was thinking of uh, Hebrews chapter 12, for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges every son whom he receives. And so in the same way, uh, as Christians, we can either do this the easy way or the hard way. And, and ultimately what we need to do is we need to submit to Christ and we need to obey his will and become servants of him because he is the only master of our life. We need to realize that. And it should, that, a healthy understanding of that should define who we are and everything we do. But if we have a wrong idea of that, then there's the rod. You know, and ultimately that's the day of judgment. God is going to uh, discipline us and, and, and give a condemning judgment if we do not obey him and become stewards. Every knee will bow before the Lord. And so that's the invitation this morning. If, if someone's not a child of God, if they haven't bowed the knee to the Lord and became a servant of him and accepted their ministry, their own personal stewardship, then you need to seriously consider that. The Lord wants you to serve him. And if, if you're not going to do that, then you're going to be condemned. And there's many people here that are already Christians. Most of you are already Christians here. And maybe we need a little adjustment, a little, a little uh, stewardship adjustment. Uh, you've you've uh, sure no doubt been on the job sometime and maybe your boss called you into the office and you had to have a little talk, a little attitude adjustment. This is not the kind of situation where you get to write your own evaluation at the end of the year. You know, some, some places they give year-end evaluations. God is going to be the one to give you the evaluation. So uh, if, if we have a feeling that we're not fulfilling our stewardship, we need to get back right with God and, and, and start start doing the things that, that he wants us to do. If we can be a service of anyone this morning, if you need the prayers of the saints, or if you want to become a, a servant of God, a child of God, uh, through Jesus Christ, by repenting of your sins, uh, a belief and confession in, in Christ as your Lord, as your master, and submit to baptism for the forgiveness of your sins and to be added to his church, we invite you to come forward as we stand and sing the song selected. Waiting.